Yeah, my name's Alex. So I work for a company called Echo, which I'm going to tell you all about and various stuff. And um, I think kind of the first thing I've got to tell you is that uh, the talk is a little bit misleadingly titled. It is about the microservices stuff. Uh, but that's only going to be half the talk. The rest of the talk is going to be far more interesting, I, I hope. Um, so what do, we, what do we do? So Echo is a, sort of a, an online pharmacy. We're one of the largest pharmacies in the UK. Um, so we're growing quite quickly. To put that in perspective, sort of uh, the year I joined, we shipped about 880 orders in the entire month. And we do that usually sort of before 2 p.m. these days, 2 or 3 p.m. So it's growing quite a lot. and. Um, on top of that, we're sort of a medication management platform as well. So it's not just getting stuff through the post. Um, it, you know, we're not just an Amazon of, uh, of deliveries. We also have this uh, whole concept of reminders and being able to see when you need to take it and whether you have taken it and how many are left in your medication and all that kind of thing and reminding you when you need to refill and go further like that. And of course, because uh, we're operating at a bigger scale, we're able to do things like reduce error rates. So we saw in typical pharmacies that you might have potential error rates of 1 in 1,000, and we can get to 1 in 15,000, 1 in 30,000, and even stronger as we change our processes. Um, it's not just an engineering team. We run our own warehouse as well, and our team includes lots of other people instead of just, just engineers. And of course, like that has manifested itself in a, an actual physical warehouse. So one of the reasons we can't run as a, if you were to sort of start your own normal business and be like, hey, I'm just going to ship people stuff you'd probably be pretty insane if you just decided I'm going to buy a warehouse and go at it. Um, it's a little bit different for us because we sell drugs. Um, there are not that many people who seem really raring to go when you say, can you ship like potential drugs to people? They seem to be less keen. So we, uh, we had to go down the warehouse route ourselves. Um, and as a result, we ended up essentially building all the technology to help us do that as well. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So go back. So, yeah, as you said, uh, the first half of this talk is going to be talking about the, um, changing the wheels in a moving bus, as I like to say, as an analogy. So, effectively, when I joined Echo sort of a year and a bit ago, the tech was very much in a startup frame of mind. And by that, I mean not particularly great. It was uh, pretty challenging in a few areas. Um, but, of course, uh, it's, it's not really that suitable to just walk in and say, hey, this sucks, let's just stop building stuff. Um, so, obviously, we have to keep the bus moving, and that's kind of so where were we about a year ago? Well, basically a year ago when I joined, we have two native apps. Um, we have one uh, Angular-based admin system. Um, both of those write directly to Firebase. There's no sort of layer to, to do any validation or anything like that. So they're both just writing straight to the database, which is great. Um, and bolted onto the side, uh, running in Google Cloud, is a, like a huge JavaScript monolithy type thing. Uh, I call it monolithy because it sort of has the ability to be a monolith, but also isn't, isn't really that big yet. Um, however, there was one file that everyone comes to know and love called server.js, which is like thousands of lines long uh, and just like one callback. So nobody really enjoyed that bit. Um, really difficult to move because of the app. So because of the apps share the logic with the back end and they both write directly to the database, it means you can't really ship anything without breaking the other thing, which is a great place to be in. Um, and the reason why uh, this sort of thing was built before I joined was that they had realized sort of fairly early on that having a database is great, but you can't actually send emails. And so they were like, oh, well, let's build something to send emails. And then they had to take payment. And they were like, oh, let's build something to take payment. And then they were like, oh, well, we need to remind people when their medication is due. So they built something to do that. And what basically ended up is they just ended up piling more and more stuff into the, the lower area, leaving less and less in the database, and then basically breaking stuff all the time. Um, the other main problem we've got is that um, basically nobody uses our app in anywhere other than England because we're based on NHS England because we have a national healthcare system. So kind of the, the, the problem with that is you've got all of your users in the UK and for everything they're doing, they're going over the Atlantic and back again, which even in the best internet is like 150 milliseconds. So 300 milliseconds just to do anything and they regularly do 20, 30, 40, 50 things for one page. So it was becoming a pretty painful experience for us to even just manage patients in the back end. Listing patients would take 10, 20 seconds because of the amount of patients that we had in the back end. Um, so this talk isn't really about how microservices are like the best thing that ever happened. This is more about just our journey and why we decided to do it. Um, 
it's an example of a system that I think does work at the end. Um, and again, the primary reasons for us moving are uh, that we have more data than just users and like likes and stuff like that. You know, if we were Tinder, you're not particularly that bothered about. I mean, you don't want to expose people's data, but we have legal ramifications for patient data. You cannot store patient data next to the data about you know, where people click, so separating it from analytics and things like that. Um, and we don't just have users. We have people who are in the warehouse as well. So we have pharmacists. We have people who pick orders. We have the customer care team, who we call CX, which you'll see in a moment. Um, these are all very, very separate systems. And if you were to build them all as one system, it kind of doesn't really make sense. You've got loads of code that does logic for you know, which order to pick in, in, uh, and how to print out the label for, for postage, which uh, if you had a monolith, you would have to write right next to the, the code for where you just like list orders for yourself, which is a bit weird. Um, we use lots of different databases, so not everything fits in SQL. Some things we have in Redis, some things we have in, in PubSub, uh, strict compliance with GDPR. Um, and the main, main thing that really you want to drive home here is the reliability. So if the warehouse goes absolutely um, dead for some reason and we run out of power in the warehouse, which, which has happened, um, it shouldn't make you, shouldn't affect you to be able to place your order. And likewise, if you can't place orders because somebody's changed the API and they've broken that, we should still be able to put things in boxes and send it out. It's medication, it has to go out the door. Um, and the way we've done that is basically make lots of tiny, small co code bases and then different areas of concerns and it's much clearer to see where you're working. Obviously, this is a bit of a difficult sell because one of my favorite SKCDs, which is like, this thing you've got looks great, not very good, so let's just chuck it in a big hole and start again. Uh, not something we can really do. We have to work out a way to get from A to B. So. What we did about a year and a bit ago before I joined, or about when I joined, sorry, is um, basically we sat down and uh, whiteboarded, what do you want? If you, if you were building this day one and you had never, um, you never had the history and legacy that you have to do with now and we were able to just completely stop the clock and rewrite the system, what would you go for? And so basically we did that sort of thinking exercise here and what you can see is we ended up with all these different services, so accounts, patients, practices, prescriptions, tasks, payments, I mean, you name it and there's a lot more than there is on there now. Um, and then decided that we'll go and estimate it. And if anyone's done any sort of agile planning before, you may know that there's a concept of agile planning poker, which is how you sort of estimate from zero to 100. And, um, you know, sort of said that sort of game. Um, the problem is that we sort of estimate it at about infinity. It took, a, it would take a long time, like years of work, basically. Um, which is what it did take, basically. Um, so instead, the key is really that we're not going to do that. We're not going to rebuild it and stop everything. We're going to obviously deliver things at the same time. And that's the key. So how do we do that? Well, here's some of the technologies we use to do that, um, which I'm going to cover briefly in a few seconds. And it really doesn't matter if you don't understand all of these technologies, because um, they all just make one system. Um, but if you, are, if you do know these things, it's, it's like the slide that everyone wants to go like, oh, yeah, I know that. Um, so we have just discussed GraphQL. So thankfully, I don't have to go over that again, which is nice. Um, but I'm going to discuss gRPC briefly because it is very key. So we don't do anything um, at Echo now that is over REST. And in fact, I don't think we have anything now that is untyped. Every single part of our stack is typed. Um, that goes from the back ends, which are written in Go, all the way to the front ends, which are in TypeScript, including the mobile apps, which of course are uh, Java, Kotlin, and um, Swift and Objective-C. Um, possibly to be transitioned to React Native, which will then be in TypeScript, so still types, which is good. Um, and the way we do that uh, is where it starts, and that starts in gRPC. So gRPC um, stands for G, which nobody knows, uh, Remote Procedure Call. Don't know why nobody knows what G is for. It's not Google, is what I'm told. But um, basically, you define a service, and that's what this is. For example, this is a, an actual example of what our patient service looks like. Um, you define a service using a, a protobuf, which is sort of a little bit like JSON, but a, a little bit more typed and you define the methods that you can do on that. So it's similar to REST, only it's a lot more sort of strict. It's like, I'm going to make a get or a search or a list, and you can be a little bit, little bit more expressive about what you're going to do. Oh, still going? Yeah, good. Um, and how you do that is you, instead of uh, doing gets and posts and updates and patches and all the HTTP methods, instead you use uh, messages. And those messages are effectively like you post some JSON and you get some JSON back effectively. However, we use protobuf. And they can be as simple as this, which is just how to get a patient. And they can end up being um, much larger than that. And ooh, no, come on. Oh, I get what it's doing. 
I think it listens to like a few clicks and then jumps in one go, which is not where I was looking for. Um, so you can end up with something much stronger than that. So this is like a larger object, of course, and this is what you'll get back if you ask for a patient, um, which is, as you may know, not like GraphQL, so you just do get the whole thing in this example. Um, and yeah, you, it's effectively very tight. So strings are strings, bulls are bulls. You have to spe specify the type of integer. You can have some special types like timestamps, um, which are actually just seconds and, and uh, milliseconds. Um, and then you can define your own types, like we have gender, address, and repeated just means it's an array. Uh, it means it can be nothing or an array, effectively. Um, and what these do basically is they compile to the language that you're going to use. So if you want to use the patient service um, at Echo, and you want to consume that, you can consume it in Go, or in Java, or in TypeScript, or in whatever you want. And basically with the definitions that we've written, they'll be converted to your native language for you, and you get all the types for free. You'll never have to type anything again. So if you come from a REST sort of environment right now, you might, you might know that if you write a, a mobile app, one of the big pains is that someone's written this great REST API for you, but you're going to have to define all these types that you're going to use locally. You don't have to do any of that. Zipkin, which is a, a tracing element, and basically what this does is anything that happens in our system goes through a, a trace, uh, or is trace, I should say, and then ends up in our system that we call Zipkin, uh, which is uh, originally designed by Twitter, and lets us know absolutely everything. So you can see here that GraphQL made a request, and then it goes to the patient service, and then there's a whole bunch of SQL that happens. Probably it's a bit too much. Um, and then, very clearly, there's a separation down the middle. And this is super important because what's happening here is that we have synchronous communication and asynchronous communication, or what we refer to as PubSub, which is uh, using Google PubSub at the moment. Um, basically, what's happened here is that somebody has created a patient, and then the uh, service has said patient.created, and anything in our system can listen to that message and then do what it wants in it. And that can be one thing or hundreds of things. It's kind of hard to tell these days. Um, in this example, we're lucky because only one thing is listening to it, I think. Um, and it happens to the patient service itself because it's probably doing something asynchronous later. So it's probably checking whether I can find that person um, or send them an email or tell them they're registered or things like that. So it's important to know that we do some things asynchronously. And that basically ends up being queues. So this is super important. I think if there's one lesson that you want to take away today, and that's to do microservices, is that queues are your friend because microservices break. And, uh, and they do break, and we have broken them. Uh, sometimes you break them intentionally, sometimes you don't. Um, and sometimes it's nothing to do with your code. So this is an example, an actual, actual example of uh, a queue that just built up, uh, unless you're still out, in which case you're probably not gonna fix it anyway. Um, and then the emails are building up, and now we're getting to hundreds and hundreds of email. Someone comes to work and realizes the alarms, things that off. And in this case, it's not actually because we broke some code, it's just because we didn't pay the bill for the email provider. Um, <laughs> the benefit, though, is that we did log in and pay the bill, and all those emails got sent. So no emails were lost, everything works, everyone's happy. So if we go back a bit, this is what we started with. So we've got you know, a few problems as I said before, is that both uh, apps on the left talk to both sides on the right. Um, both of the apps on the left just talk directly to the Firebase, which is pretty difficult for validation and typing. So you know, someone would implement something in the admin uh, that added a specific field, and then the apps didn't like it, so the apps would just start crashing. And you'd have no way, like debugging that was just a nightmare, because um, the error you would get back is just like, we crashed because we didn't know this thing exists, and you're like, well, what is that thing? Because it's not typed. Um, and so you would just go back and forth again and again and again. And so how did we attempt to start making something that could move away from that? And the first step of that was actually GraphQL. So basically what we did is we put GraphQL between the apps and Firebase. Um, GraphQL, which was, uh, we wrote in Node first, and we're now rewriting it to Go, because people just seem to want to rewrite everything in Go at Echo now. Um, basically what happened is, we still talk to Firebase through GraphQL, but the apps now just talk to GraphQL. What this means for us is that we can release the apps, which is not for Android, but for iOS, very slow. Um, and then once the apps are shipped, they speak to GraphQL, and then in the background we can change things, and nobody knows the difference. Um, it also means that we can replicate and fix bugs over time a lot quicker. So examples of that we've had are sort of strange behaviors we've had in apps where somebody set a patient with a slightly weird detail and the apps are crashing. And before we would have had to uh, release an app fix for that. Uh, but now what we do is go in GraphQL and just write some really horrible code. So we go like, oh, are you Android? I'll do this instead. Uh, but it does mean that it, it gets fixed straight away rather than it being fixed later on. Um, 
Um, so then what we introduced between the two is Go services. This is a little friendly gopher. Um, basically now what we're doing is we're, we're rewriting stuff. We're getting to the point now where we can implement things one at a time. So the key that GraphQL lets us do is we can change the patient's part of the system, and the rest of the system is still talking to Firebase, it's still talking to the monolith, that's still all happening. We notice that we haven't even touched the admin, and that kind of is um, kind of a cool side effect, is that we actually don't need to. So the admin's talking to Firebase, and then the Firebase is talking back to the patient service and talking to the apps, and the user doesn't notice that we've added this whole new system. Um, and neither does the admin team, because even if there was a small delay in it reaching the admin, they're not gonna know, because the user who is using the app is unlikely to be the person who's using the admin. So they don't know there's a difference in the delay. Um, the problem is that this is a really bad way of doing things. So in this example, the patient service has to know about Firebase. And that means that straight away out the gate, you've just written loads of code to do with like data migrations and, and moving things together. And you've got loads of Go code now that's like, oh, is, uh, is this a Firebase record? Is this not a Firebase record? Or do I need to be thinking about what's in the monolith or whatnot? Um, and so we decided that that's not the way we're gonna go. We implemented something called Sync. Um, and Sync is basically a microservice, but Sync only talks uh, asynchronous, asynchronously. Um, sync synchronously? That's probably a badly named, wasn't it? Um, so Sync, as in it syncs things back and forth, talks only asynchronously, let's get that right. Um, basically how that works is that Sync is the dirty code that you don't wanna write. Sync is the code that manages the transition and the migration. Uh, it's really horrible, but it's built exactly with the intent that you're gonna throw it away. And I'm glad to say that we did actually throw it away about a month ago, and uh, that, was, that was definitely a cause for beer at that point. Um, basically what happens with Sync is that Sync listens to Firebase. When things in Firebase change, it takes the Firebase record. Um, it knows what type of Firebase record it is, so if it's a patient, it will take that patient, transform it into the patient that we want from our microservices, and then an emit event that says a new patient has been created and then the patient service listens to that. So I'm gonna show you some graphs that makes it a little bit more easier to understand, but effectively what this means and the super key constraint is that Sync is the only piece of software in the entire system that knows about both things. It knows about new and old. But the new system knows nothing of the old and the old system knows nothing of the new. Sync is only the key, the key link there. Um, here's an example of what Sync looks like in the mega tracing system. So we have completely new tech up here on the left which is uh, create dispatch is uh, someone in the warehouse printing a label and then putting it on a box. So the reason why it's really slow is because Royal Mail. Um, so that's actually going to the system and then printing it out on a PDF. Um, and then a bunch of stuff happens where we do all this stuff and actually what you can see here is that Sync has picked it up and Sync is then doing a bunch of Firebase writes to make sure that all the data looks correct in Firebase and anything that's reading Firebase. Um, um, I quite like using these types of graphs to explain microservices things, because you're quite good to do lots of different components, um, is that GraphQL will do a synchronous call to patient service, create the patient, finish its job, patient will say, I've been created, sync will pick that up and write that to Firebase. The other way around is basically similar. Firebase uh, will emit an event saying that something's happened, we actually use cloud functions to listen to Firebase. The cloud functions then put something on pub sub that sync picks it up, and then sync functions that back to the patient service. So what you end up with is something quite horrible after a while. You end up with a whole bunch of microservices. Uh, here's some example services. Um, and now they're all syncing back and forth with sync, and the sync code is super complex because it's got um, hundreds of lines of code, not thousands, sorry, go, so hundreds of lines of code um, that just know how to transform objects and do really dirty things with them, like turn arrays not into arrays and objects not into objects and weird things like that. And it's constantly writing to Firebase and if you started to look at the logs of sync at this point, it would make you a bit dizzy because it was just doing hundreds of things all the time. Um, but the benefit of this is that at a certain point, you can just get rid of it. And now you're left with the microservice system that you always wanted and dreamed of. They have no code that knows anything about any legacy code and everything just seems to be working swimmingly. Well, it's all the swimmingly, obviously. It's still a real system. Um, and you're left with what you wanted all along. But you notice that the one omission that I had there is I didn't tell you anything about the, um, the admin system. So we use uh, uh, lots of different types of admin systems. This is our, uh, what we call the customer service tool. Don't worry, it is staging data, unless uh, Trance the Wrapper actually has ordered lots of pain killers recently. Um, basically, the way these work is we, we rewrote uh, into lots of different tools as well. And these uh, speak directly gRPC 
to the services. So we don't use GraphQL for the back end, we just speak GRPC directly, and we use GRPC in the browser. And basically what that looks like is that our services, when you push the CI, they just, um, all those packages, and then you just get a free, fully typed uh, API client, and it's kind of magic. So this is not uh, an echo request, this is just an example of requests of how you use that. Use that. And if anyone's familiar with uh, the fetch API in Chrome, it's, it's pretty similar. You just import some code, uh, you call GRPC unary instead of fetch, because unary is one-way communication. Um, set some stuff and you get back a response. It's basically a request response like everything else, except for it's all fully typed, and it goes to our gateway and you get all the security and you get GRPC. To do this, we use something called the gateway. <coughs> the gateway is basically just a simple microservice that exposes our microservices to the outside world, but it's obviously a lot more locked down because you can do things like, you know, uh, change poster labels or resend things to people or refunds and stuff like that. Um, and that's like IP locked and things like that. So basically there's, you can't get to the tool unless you have the right auth and you can't get to the gateway unless you have the right auth and you can't get to the service because the service will only talk to the gateway. So layers of auth are quite important in that example. And the way that's implemented is that in the gateway we have a, uh, like a, an RBAC type system, roles and requests. And for example, if you're in the uh, group there of general ops, you're allowed to do most things, but you're not allowed to mark a dispatch as not delivered. So that would be like, if you're doing certain jobs and we can deny and not deny certain things at certain times, um, allow, that's the word for that. <laughs> um, and then obviously we use everyone's favorite friend, Jenkins. Um, yes, yeah, so this is where everyone goes, whoa, what are you doing? This sounded great until you said Jenkins. Um, yeah, Jenkins is great. Like basically we use our old friend Jenkins because we originally were on Circle CI and went through very few iterations of that and spent a lot of time trimming those files around, but we have two really hard requirements that we could only really get out of Jenkins. And one is that we want to be able to do anything with RCI. Like, I want to, I just want to, basically I just want something that runs bash scripts. Um, and there are more complex things that we do than that, obviously, but the din default is that I don't want to use your crazy, clever system, I just want to be able to write bash. Um, and that we have to run it inside the cluster because we are not okay with Circle CI deploying to production because that means that a third party company has access to our production cluster and it's all hell is broken loose. So um, if you keep it inside, generally everything's safe. So that's what Jenkins does, it lives inside and the list grows. We also then make it a little bit easier for the average, uh, average developer because basically, you know, not everyone likes Jenkins, surprising shock to me. Uh, but if you don't want to touch Jenkins, you don't have to, you just push your code to master and then you can just click on proceed and that'll go to production and everything's fine. If you want to know what you did, you can click on the view, view commit diff. Um, and if you don't like someone's code or you just, just want to annoy them, you can press the abort button and they have to do another push. Um, of course, really key as well is monitoring in our system. So this is Grafana, which is an amazing dashboard system and we use uh, Prometheus in the back, which you don't really need to know much about, but it's just like, a, it's a little bit like New Relic and uh, Datadog and lots of other metrics providers. And we're just obsessed with all the data basically. And this is, uh, this is all the data we have for internal uh, publish subscribe data. We can see how many things are um, waiting in queues and what's the throughput of all the system. And we have specific ones for microservices as well. So, because you can build your own dashboards out of your own data, we can do things like this, which is a, a dashboard that shows you every single service and you can see all the services at once. So you can click on a particular service and see how many requests it's getting, you know, a thousand a second here. And a different, uh, what's the GC like in Go and uh, what's the memory usage, which happens to be 20 megabytes in Go, which is pretty insane. Um, and then, of course, alerts. So you can set up a custom alert. We have general alerts as well, like you're using too much CPU, but you can set up a custom alert, um, which would be some, for something that if you've made specifically. So, you know, if you've got a third party API, you can add your own alerts to say, let me know if this API gets slow, and then we'll write an alert for that. Um, and if you don't answer the alert in a certain amount of time, you'll get a text message, and then you can respond appropriately to the text message. Unfortunately, PagerDuty do not accept monkey emojis right now, which is quite distressing for me personally as well. So that was the, um, that was the microservice stuff, which uh, if you're into that stuff, is quite fun. But if you're not into that stuff, you may find this stuff just more fun. So I mentioned before that we have a physical warehouse. That's really where all the fun is. So basically, we end up doing actual physical stuff these days. So shipping stuff and printing labels, and uh, we actually found a use for QR codes. Who knew it existed? Uh, thousands and thousands of QR codes. Um, and so what we're doing on the right there is printing out all of the stock locations uh, for our system, and I can leave this running for about 20 minutes, and it won't have finished. And if you want to know how long it is, 
Um, is that long? Um, um, and yeah, because we have like this. So uh, uh, a problem with our, how our warehouse compared to other warehouses is that um, the distribution of our line is like huge. So we have lots and lots of packages of one thing. So if your doctor prescribes you a very specific thing, uh, we'll go and get that for you, and we need to find a place to put it, and we need to know where it is. Um, we need to know that if someone else orders it, they don't steal yours. Um, and so we have lots of problems like that, and so unlike a traditional big warehouse where you have pallets worth of stuff and you just take one off, we just have uh, lots and lots of, uh, as we call them, the UK pigeonholes. I don't know why they're called pigeonholes. Um, so how does, uh, how does a day in the life of a warehouse worker work? Well, we have written our own custom um, system for picking, which we call Beatbop. Uh, Beatbop works similar to what we were saying before. It's built in React Native, um, and it runs on iOS devices, which we have in these like cool scanner cases that have like a really good barcode scanner on them because the camera is just not quick enough when you're doing day-to-day -day scanning. Um, and so we deploy and run all this ourselves, and it's backed by microservices like stock service and stuff like that, which I'll show you in a moment. But basically what you do is you take a pic, as we've just seen, which gives you a list of locations. You walk to your location, scan the location, uh, and then you scan the specific medica medication in that system. So if you're looking for, in this example, 10 milligrams, it has to be that barcode. It will refuse to scan any other, any other barcode for various obvious reasons. Put them into your little uh, basket, and off you go. Um, obviously, when we started out, we had some quite nice uh, solutions, like the nice uh, string around your neck. I don't believe everyone does that. I think that's just George's bright idea to speed it up. But basically, this is what you do is you scan when you think. I think George is actually doing a, a stock take there. Um, in the back end, this looks like uh, any other service. We have a stock service, and you've got pretty normal methods. Get, update, search. And you can see now where things start to move away from rest. So now you're getting things like increment, decrement, stock some stock in, move some stock in, check, pick. Um, you know, these sort of things you can fit to rest, but really in an RPC environment, it kind of works a bit better like this. Um, but it's not that easy. So the real question is, why did we build our own picking solution? It seems like you can just buy this stuff off the shelf, right? I mean, um, it's pretty difficult to convince people who um, have bought a warehouse and have previous experience of running warehouses, like, hey, we just want to build everything from scratch. And they're just like, uh, why would you do that? Well, the reason is that it's not that easy because medication is fuzzy sometimes. So we'll get into why. That might be a, a weird use case in a minute. But unlike other warehouses, we deal in combinations. So for example, um, if you order a pair of scissors from Amazon, you want a specific pair of scissors. They're going to say whether they've got a pair of scissors, and they're going to ship you a pair of scissors. They don't go, what you need is a left handle and a right handle, and maybe you should have one in blue and one in red. Doesn't matter, right, because they're still scissors. Um, unfortunately, that is how medication works. You just go like, you need roughly 200 in this form and this strength, and we'll see whether we've got them and making them up. Um, we can do things that we think are better than off-the-shelf products. So we can organize by knowing what we sell the most and moving that to the foremost to the warehouse, and that lets us reduce walking, for example. Um, this is something that you, you do see from the other products, but because they don't know about medication, they don't know how to formalize that into different ways, and we can just basically teach you to do a little bit better, I think. Now, in order to understand why you would build stuff, we have to talk about the crazy world of medication first. So, unfortunately, life is not that easy in medication world. So. If your doctor orders you uh, sertraline, which is 100 milligrams, we often refer to sertraline as a VMP, which is a virtual medical product. Which, as you can see, has a quite a nice ID there as well. Virtual product, medical products, um, they don't really exist. You, um, you will not be shipped to virtual medical products because it's just a concept. What actually exists is uh, sertraline 100 milligram tablets made by Sigma Pharmaceuticals Limited. Um, and that is what we refer to as an AMP. That's a actual medical product. Unfortunately, that does not actually exist as well. Um, you can't get that. What you actually need is certainly in 100 milligram tablets by Sigma Pharmaceuticals Limited, you'll see 30 tablets. So it's a 30 pack of 100 milligram. That's what we call an actual medical product, uh, product pack. So that's an AMPP. So our warehouse is only full of PP AMPPs. There are no other AMPs, VMPs. They're all just concepts. What you actually ship at the end of the day is an AMPP. The problem is, that, as you might be able to guess, lots of people make sertraline, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different combinations um, of how to do that. And if you actually want a visualization of what that looks like, it's like this, which is kind of mental. So 
we sort of formalized it out in, a, in an easy way to think about it. And this is where the services come into play. So it's important to note here that we, we use two services to work out what we can pick for a certain order. Um, and they don't know anything about each other. So you ask to pick with an ID. And what you're going to get back is a list of potential combinations you can pick ordered by what's in stock. So if you need 200 tablets, we can give you two 100s. We can give you four 50s. We can overpick a little bit and pick some out of the pack. We can underpick a little bit and then send you some more the next week if we've got some in stock. There's various things you can do with that. Um, and what we do is slice this down the middle from a service point of view, and we go to the stock service and say, hey, I'd like to pick sertraline, 100 milligrams, I need 100. And the stock service says, OK, cool. But I don't know anything about medication. So it goes to the medication service and says, can you tell me what all of the pharmaceutically dispensable things are for sertraline 100 milligrams. And basically, that, the distinction there is that the medication service knows what the difference between sertraline and other types of sertraline are. So brand names and different things like that. And the stock service does not. So the medication service comes back and says, yeah, here's a list of things that you can uh, you know, legally give out for that. And then the stock service looks at what it's got in stock, and it does the combination logic to say, like, cool, so you wanted 200. I don't have any 200s. They have never existed. But I do have two 100s. Um, and they're in stock, and they're in location 6B, so I'm going to send them to 6B. And the key thing there is that stock knows nothing about medications, and medications knows nothing about stock. The stock service is actually kind of dumb, really. It lit it's just key value of like AMPP and where it lives. So you can see in this example, if you were to ask for um, what we call a picking combination, because everything is usually combinations, and you can get things from more than one location. Um, all you see is it knows about locations, and it's not telling you anything about surgery. The key thing to note is that it's telling you that we have 42, and uh, they come in packs of 28. And you can get those in location 70B. Um, we can even do multiple locations now. So if we don't have enough for 70B, but we do have also some more for 71A, we're going to tell you to pick two from one and one from another and things like that. Uh, and if you want to see what some actual code looks like, it's, it's really not that uh, difficult, because the because we split these things out into different things, we just have one function that's like almost mathematical. It, it doesn't know anything about medication. It doesn't know anything about sizes. All it knows is that you are going to ask for um, a target. So I need to pick 200, and I have them in these available sizes. And I want you to just do the, the maths to work out what are the best combinations to do that. I must admit that I didn't write this. This was made by one of our colleagues, Jesus, who, uh, who definitely wrote a nice, cleaner version than I would have done. Um, and so it's really simple, right? until someone comes to you with the one problem where it's not that simple, obviously, as with everything in life. Um, it turns out that um, creams are the, are, the, are the problem. So it's always simple to say that, yes, you need 200 tablets. And so for that, we can give you two packs of 100. Um, but in the medication world, that's always not that great. So for example, um, a lot of medication comes in packs of 28 or, or weird sizes like that. And so what we'll do is pick you more than is necessary. So 210 tablets, for example. That will go to the pharmacist. The pharmacist will actually get out a pair of scissors and cut the required medication off, put it back in the pack, make sure you've got what you were prescribed, and send it out the door. So the logic that we need is to always over or under pick. But legally, you cannot over or under pick creams. So now we have to write logic that's a little bit more nuanced, and it has to know about creams, unfortunately. So for example, if you order chamomile lotion, which is the thing that I actually search for, it does exist. Um, and your doctor prescribes you 500 milligrams, but we only have two 300 milligrams, we cannot pick the order. We have to give you the exact amount. And so you end up with kind of weird logic where you're like, if it's a cream, do this. If it's not a cream, do that, which is great. Um, so we did write that. We wrote that logic, and we said, cool. Um, we'll ask the medication service if it's uh, what we call discrete, and we'll decide to give you exact amounts for that and non-exact amounts for tablets. Cool. And then a week later, someone comes back and says, uh, that doesn't really work. And the reason is because it turns out in the medical database that things like tape are considered creams. They're discrete. So for example, if you're prescribed 50, um, 50 centimeters of tape, um, we can give you more or less tape. Um, and the problem is that they never made 50 centimeters of tape. So the system's telling us, you have to pick 50 centimeters of tape. We don't have that. We've never seen that and it refuses to get picked. So there's all these little nuances that you have to work out. Um, yeah, basically, in the, in, the, in, the, in the case of that, what you have to do is sort of like go back and ask for the right amount, which is annoying. But yeah, you get all these problems. And um, 
the main problem that we have is that doctors will prescribe something that no longer exists, which is kind of valid. They'll prescribe a, a specific bottle of something that used to be made in, in uh, half a liter and is now longer available in, in half a liter. Um, you also end up with lots of physical problems, which, which as a software developer you don't really encounter or you don't think about so much, and that's things like, like barcodes just, that just won't scan for some reason. And so we had to make a system where you can print out a new barcode and assign that barcode to the item by searching for the item. Um, you also end up with things like things that go out of date or get damaged or um, just frankly come in the wrong packet or a, a you know, manufacturing defect and things like that. Um, so yeah. So I mentioned briefly before about optimizing for walking distance. I think this is a good example of the power you have when you actually own, own the tech behind the warehouse. So previously, stockers in our system would do a very good educated guess of putting the medication where they think is best. So if you get in um, inhalers, you're going to put them pretty close to the front because you're going to sell a lot of inhalers, and that kind of makes sense. The problem with that is that it changes over time. So inhalers might be popular today, they might not be popular tomorrow for us as a service. You might have other things moving in and out. And it's really hard to keep statically allocated locations because the stock service is trying to keep its own mental model and they're trying to fight against that by putting it in places that they think are best. And so what we did instead was use data to inform that um, and use a better way of doing that. So we know what we dispatch. We know every day what goes out of the warehouse because they scan everything like four or five times, so they scan it once when they pick it, they scan it when they dispense it, then they scan it when they put it into the box as well. Um, so with all that data, we have all of our data pushed into uh, BigQuery. Um, and with BigQuery, you can run a massive query that comes back and says, these are your top selling lines, ordered in this specific way. And so what we do then is organize the warehouse basically so that if you're stood in front of you and there's three lines, then you're gonna have the top three selling lines here and then uh, arrange them for me. And that can change daily, and then they can pick themselves out of that. The problem is, as I was discussing before, there is literally thousands of different types of combinations. So the problem that we're trying to optimize for isn't really that big of a problem because it's, it only accounts for the, the tiniest first percent of um, stuff, and then the rest of it is literally one or two packets of something. So your warehouse really just has to act in two modes. Previously, we've called it bulk and not bulk. So front of your warehouse acts more as a, a fast picking lane where you can pick up lots of different things like uh, metazol and all the big hitters in the, in the drug world. And then the rest of it is pigeonholes where you can get those things. So you know, the problem with optimizing for walking distance in that situation is that, yeah, you might have asthma. Um, great that we've managed to just reach an arm's length to go and get it. But your doctor may have also prescribed you something that's down here, because uh, you know, most orders will have more than one thing. And you're just going to end up walking there anyway. So, still to be decided. However, um, yeah, this is an example of, of one of the uh, bulk lines, by the way, where you get obviously more things in one thing. Um, the benefit of this system, though, is that because we know where things are, we're able to um, pick ourselves out of a problem. So, 2C is a good example. The reason why I got a picture of this today is because uh, previously we had one medication in there that was not particularly a great seller, and since we statically allocated all the positions, effectively what the system did is told them to put stuff in 2C, and then as they pick their way around the warehouse, they empty the locations where it wasn't needed, and then it forms back into the right place. So a good way of testing that for fun is that you can grab one of these boxes, and then you can go and put it in a random location, um, and then if you come back after lunch, you'll see that it's been picked. And that's kind of what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. This is like all the boxes and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alex, any questions? One question right here. It's a, it's a warehouse-related question. Uh, don't you think um, many of those optimization problems that you described could be eliminated if you would use um, RFID instead of barcodes? Uh, yeah, we did look at RFID. Um, the problem with RFID is that it's way too expensive to, to deploy on a medical scale like that. So if you put RFID on everything, you've got two problems. The first one is that you 
have increased the workload of every time you get a box in. So if we get a box of 1,000, you have to now put 1,000 RFID tags on it. And the second problem is that RFID tags cost, you know, like 4p. And often our profit can be, can be that on some things. So, um, you know, hopefully it's more. But as to deploy it on a big scale is really difficult. But where we do look into RFID is um, we have looked into doing that for the baskets themselves because that you have a set amount of baskets, for example. So as you move around the warehouse, um, in the future they're going to scan the baskets to start what they're doing. But obviously RFID would be better because you don't have to get it in the right way for the scanner. So we can use RFID for like constant amounts of things, but to, to use RFID for just an ongoing scale is not that profitable. And I think that's the same reason why supermarkets and stuff have never adopted it for loaves of bread because it just kills their profit on a loaf of bread. But it is cool and I did buy a lot of RFID packs for this. Um, any more questions? So that's all. Thank you, Alex. So up next.